Thanks very much for that introduction. When Dr. Colombo asked me to come uh, as the Hansborough lecturer, it was a pretty easy decision, although with all those things, it's a timing issue. But I first met Dr. Hansborough when I finished my training in 1986 and had moved to San Antonio, and I served on a, a, a safety monitoring board uh, for one of the companies uh, that he was working with in this area of dermal substitutes. And what Dr. Potenza said was true. There were basically three groups over the last 20 or 30 years that have really made inroads in dermal substitutes. Uh, there's the group by John Burke at MGH. Um, there's the group at the uh, Cincinnati Shrine. And then there was the work that John Han Hansborough did here uh, with various groups. And uh, he really was a pioneer in that way. So for me, uh, it's a great treat to come as a Hansborough lecturer and to uh, come after people like Dr. Pruitt, Herndon, Gamelli that have been here in the past. When you try to decide what to talk about uh, for Grand Rounds somewhere, it's usually uh, not the easiest thing. You want to try to pick topics that are uh, going to interest some people, and you don't want to come and talk about strengths that exist in the department you're going to speak to. So when you come to UCSD and you're going to talk about trauma issues, it's not so easy. And I spent a great day yesterday with the division listening to some clinical cases and some research. And I just have a couple of slides to remind me of the strengths of this division and this program in this area. And under Dr. Coimber and Dr. Hoyt, uh, this program has been a leader in trying to figure out various <coughs> aspects of uh, trauma and inflammation and how we can modulate the response. So I sort of nixed that as my idea. A second might be that we could talk about uh, innovative trauma care. And this is an example of an endovascular repair of a, just above the diaphragm blunt aortic injury that we did about eight or nine years ago. But again, come to UCSD and talk about innovations in trauma care is uh, not the easiest thing to do. And, and finally, you could come talk about the future of trauma surgery. And uh, Dr. Hoyt and Dr. Clamber have been uh, integral in trying to redefine trauma surgery nationally and uh, this concept of acute care surgery. And so I sort of nixed that idea. But taken in context with the Hansborough lecture um, and our role in some disaster management thing, it seemed more appropriate to try to come and talk about that rather than to try to duplicate the strengths of your department. If, I, if you go back to seven years ago in our department, I became chair uh, in uh, 2000. Um, if you were to look at Rhode Island Hospital, Rhode Island Hospital is a tertiary quaternary hospital affiliated with Brown. It's about a 720-bed hospital and is the only tertiary quaternary hospital for a catchment area of about 1.5 million situated in between Yale, New Haven, and Boston. But if you looked at our hospital disaster preparedness in the year 2000, we were like most places in the United States. We had simulated large-scale disasters that happened outside of the hospital. We'd move patients around, sort of. You know, we'd get together, we'd talk about it and say how well did we did, and uh, we'd modify our plan a little bit. But the reality was uh, we didn't do much. Patients or fake patients were brought to the ER. They had a toe tag placed, and you did this, that, you're going to do this with them. But that was it. It all stopped at the emergency room. And the reality is, as an institution, we really weren't prepared to do anything in 2000. And there are lots of reasons why that's so. The primary one, however, there was no physician commitment outside of probably emergency medicine. Everybody's busy. Everybody in this room is busy. You have lots of other things to do on a daily basis. And to sit there and plan for what might happen, but in your heart, you don't believe it will happen, um, just didn't make sense. The other thing was, it was lack of leadership. The reality was, even myself, as a previous chief of uh, trauma and critical care, now chair of uh, surgery and the chair of medicine, we really didn't embrace the effort. And so we had a lot of ambivalence in what was going on. Everybody knows this picture, and I bet everybody in this room remembers exactly what they were doing when they first saw this on TV. But this changed our thought process about disaster preparedness on a hospital level. For me, I was in Baltimore um, giving oral surgery exams, and I remember it well. We had just finished giving three exams, and we had met to grade those three uh, uh, people. And uh, my uh, associate examiner that day was Tom Scalila, who's uh, chief at shock trauma in Baltimore. And, we were getting ready to start the next exam, and he didn't come back. And finally, he showed up. He says, I got to leave. I said, you don't have anywhere to go. We've got a whole day of exams to give. And he says, no, I got to go. Turn on the TV. And I turned on the TV, and that's what I saw. And I suspect everybody in this room, as I said, knows exactly what they were doing at that moment. Well, that event, or series of events in, uh, in Washington, in New York, and then Pennsylvania, really did spur 
the government to rethink what they were doing. And this is just one of the pages of the 9-11 uh, report put out by the uh, Titan Corporation. And it, it wasn't surprising what they said. And they said, you know, if we're going to be able to respond to these things, you have to prepare for these things. And everybody in this room knows that. If we're going to go this morning to do an operation, we prepare our patient, we think about what we're going to do, we have an operative plan, we think in our minds what we're going to do. If A doesn't work, what would we do? We'll do B. And we do that all the time. We prepare for everything we do in life. And if we're going to have disaster preparedness, it's a matter of pre-disaster preparedness. So it wasn't surprising that that was their primary finding. What was surprising, however, is that their primary finding was despite the World Trade Center attacks in 1993, so this had already been done once, as a nation and as uh, individual trauma systems and counties and states and hospitals, we were woefully unprepared for what happened on 9-11. And that is somewhat surprising. We'd been through this once 14 years ago, and we didn't do much because the thought process was this the sense of ambivalence that it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen where I live. It's not going to happen in San Diego. It's not going to happen in Providence because who would ever want to bomb San Diego or Providence or do something like that? So that sense of ambivalence. So post 9-11, a whole lot of things happened, both on a national level, although those have probably not been as successful, but on regional levels, and that is federal organizations got involved. And, but a more important thing was to look at individual hospital experiences. And I say that because the reality is at some point, no matter what happens, patients need to receive care, and they're going to receive care in hospitals. They're not going to receive care out in the community. And at some point, the rubber hits the road where physicians and uh, ancillary personnel have to provide care for these. So it was important to start looking at individual hospital experiences. But the problem with that is that they're not very common. And I suspect not very many people in this room have had an opportunity to participate in these kinds of things. I was, had somewhat of a unique uh, uh, first eight or 10 years of my practice working for the Army Burn Center where I had flown around the world responding to disasters, so to speak, picking up patients, moving them around the world. And I'd had some experience starting with the uh, launch tool or the Ramstein Air Show disaster in 1986 all the way up to other things like the uh, Pope Air Force uh, plane crash in 1994. But the reality is they're rare, they're unique, but the rea and the reality also is the same disaster principles apply. So we had to change our concept. Disasters do occur, they may occur in your backyard, and if you're not prepared, um, you're not going to be ready to care for them. So at our hospital, we changed our concepts of what we were going to do. It was that it might happen in our area, um, we need to consider all threats and scenarios, and we uh, became committed to it. Soon after 9-11, the chair of medicine and myself uh, put forth a plan where we met every Thursday morning at 7 o'clock in my office. We brought into that meeting the people that we needed to, to work on a specific aspect of our hospital plan. So sometimes it would be infectious disease people, sometimes it would be the trauma people, sometimes it would be hospital administration, but we put together or tried to start putting together a hospital plan that was uh, not uh, silo-based, that would consider all threats, that we would be prepared to uh, uh, act if we had to. The hospital put into a system this uh, hospital emergency incident command system, which I'll show you in just a second. But the best part of this was is that we became committed to it. So over the course of that year, we probably met about 30 times. We put together a uh, online disaster plan, so to speak, that would consider trauma-related things, infectious disease-related things. Remember, this was, we had the whole anthrax scare going on at the time, and there was a threat of biologics or neurotoxins, et cetera. This is the HIKES plan, um, and this was rolled out at our very first meeting by the administration, and you don't need to see anything on this except to understand that in the under its original version, all those boxes were filled by hospital administration. And one of the ways I got in control of this, or I got in charge of this, is I was sitting at a meeting. I said uh, to a hospital president, I said, this is all great, but it's actually physicians who take care of patients, and there's no physicians on this thing. So I got put in one of those top boxes, and he says, great, now you can be in charge of this. The only uh, solace I had in that is the chair of medicine was putting the box right under me, so he had to uh, answer to me. So once again, surgery came out on the top. But, you know, even with all this effort, we, we still really weren't sure that this was ever going to be something we had to worry about. And you know and I know that uh, here we are some six years or whatever later, we're now saying, oh, we have increased threat levels again. But even, you know, a few months after 
most parts of the country went back to sort of normal. And the only time we really worried about any of this is when we went to the airport and had to stand in security lines and things like that that were new. Well, for us, though, uh, not too many, 15 months later or so, things did change. And on February 20th, 2003, at just about 11 o'clock at night, there was a nightclub, which was a couple of miles from where I lived at the time, that uh, had this band. It was a 60s rock band, sort of a revival thing called Great White. And they had some pyrotechnics that they set off in, a, in this uh, nightclub. And this is a film uh, uh, that was uh, taken by one of the co-owners, who happened to also act as a freelance photographer for uh, Channel 12. But this uh, set off one of the worst fire disasters in U.S. history, and you know, little did we know that, uh, that this was going to happen. At the time, at 10.55 at night, I was at home. Um, I, was, I had actually I'd just sat down on my bed and was considering uh, reading. Um, I turned the TV on, and there was actually a Celtics game on the end of a Celtics game, and the Celtics haven't been very good for a long time, and they were losing. And my pager went off, and my chief resident said, well, you know, we just got this phone call, and we're expecting 100 burn patients. Uh, I don't know. You know, you sit there, you get phone calls like that, and you say, yeah, okay. And I sat down on the bed, and I said, call me when you know more. And I, I don't think both of my gluteus had settled on the bed when I said, you know, it's not going to look very good if this is true and I'm sleeping. So I got up, I put a pair of scrubs on, and I got in my car. Um, and got on the, I lived about a mile from uh, 95, got on the interstate thinking that this, I'll be home in an hour and I'll go to sleep. And I looked at my rearview mirror and I could see about six ambulances following me up 95 towards Providence. So uh, you know what, the reality was this was true. I called into the hospital. Um, the uh, incident, the disaster plan had already been initiated, been initiated by a nurse by the head nurse in the ER. She got in the call and she, in, and she initiated, and that's part of a good disaster plan. There were some good things that occurred at the change of shift so that we were able to keep both the evening personnel and obviously the incoming night personnel. And by enacting our disaster plan, within 20 or 30 minutes, we had 12 surgical attendings and 12 ED attendings in the emergency room, and we had about 50 residents, a combination of general surgery and emergency medicine residents. There's 50 residents in our general surgery program. There's 50 emergency medicine residents or so in that program. So half of our residents were at the hospital within uh, 20 or 30 minutes. So we had quite a group of personnel to start taking care of this. To go back to the nightclub for just a second, there were 439 people, the best we can tell, in the nightclub. And more than 200 of them were treated for injuries. Most were released that night. Only 80 were admitted to the hospital, and their average burn size was 17%. About two-thirds of them had inhalation injury. The first patient hit our doors at about 11.35, and they came sort of in droves. Um, each patient was met uh, by myself and our uh, Vice President of Inpatient Affairs, who happens to be a nurse, and they, we triaged the patients. Chair of Medicine came in, about, he got there at about 11.15, and he asked me what I wanted, and I said, well, I think I need 100 beds, and I need 50 ICU beds. And his job was to go up to both the medical and surgical floors with his staff and the medical critical care people and to clear out those pieces of the hospital. Chief of Emergency Medicine job was to clear out the emergency room. And we have a busy emergency room. We see almost 130,000 patients a year in our emergency room, making it the fourth busiest emergency room in the United States. So it's never without patients in it. And we were in our old emergency room at the time, which was a decrepit thing built in the mid-'70s, built for 60,000 patients a year. But the ER was cleared out. And the acute area of the ER was where we triaged patients who we didn't deem critical. Two attendings and two residents were assigned there. But for each patient that we deemed critical, they were assigned <coughs> an attending, mostly a surgical attending, but maybe an emergency medicine attending, a senior resident, a junior resident, and a nurse. And those people stayed with the patient through triage, through their immediate care. If they went to the operating room, then obviously the surgeons took them to the operating room where they brought them up to the ICU, et cetera, to initiate their care and hand over the care to the ICU teams, which were assembled in a similar fashion, and then would come back to the ER to get another patient. So that's how we handled our patients. In the first 12 hours at our hospital, we saw 64 patients. We released 17 of them. We admitted 44 of them. I transferred three that night to MGH. We have 
had a pseudo regional burn plan, um, and I talk more about that later. Uh, but at the time that I transferred a few patients to Boston, I did so because I'd gotten a phone call saying you can expect another 100 patients. We knew that we could handle about 100 patients, but now they're telling us that we were going to get somewhere between 150 and 200 patients, and that was going to uh, by far exceed our surge capacity or what we view our, viewed our surge capacity for that number of injured patients. As it turned out, that was a false report, and we didn't get any more patients. So the first patient got there at 1130. It's the first time in a decade our emergency room went on bypass for um, everything. We never go on bypass for trauma, peds, or cardiac or neurosurgery, but we did go on bypass. But by 5 on the morning, all patients were tucked in where they should be. For those that had to go to the OR, they'd gone to the OR. The rest were in the ICUs or on the floor. And uh, at 8 o'clock in the morning, the, OR, the ER opened up for business as usual. The OR was pushed, uh, the routine elective OR schedule was pushed till 10 that morning, just so we made sure that uh, we, we had the resources. But we did our complete elective schedule that morning. And for me, I had a pancreas on that day, and I didn't know when I'd get to do it if I didn't do it. So I actually did my Whipple at 10, and finished it a little after 2, and then went back to it. But the hospital, within a period of time, in less than 12 hours, got back to business as usual, despite having this influx of near 70 patients. Just to uh, diverge for just uh, one moment, regional hospitals were important. There were 27 hospitals that were eventually transferred from all Rhode Island hospitals to uh, hospitals in Massachusetts, and these included the MGH, the Shriners Burns Center for Kids in Boston. It was the first time they'd ever taken care of an adult patient, the Brigham Burn Unit and the fledging unit at UMass. The patients that were transferred were about 32 years of age. On average, they had an average burn size of 30 percent, but it ranged from 10 to 75. And of this group of 27 patients, there were four late deaths. There were small, 10 small burns, however, that were kept at local hospitals within Rhode Island. Rhode Island has 11 acute care hospitals in the state, uh, but most of them are small 100 bed or so hospitals. <coughs> within Rhode Island Hospital, after we had done everything over that course of a day, we ended up with 39 patients. They were 32 years of age, ranging from uh, 18, which was a, uh, a college freshman, uh, to 43. Uh, their average burn size was only 15 percent, as you can see, ranging from 3 to 60. But two-thirds of them had inhalation injury, and 70 percent of them required ICU care because of their need for intubation. Over the next week, we kept two attending surgeons in-house and four residents, and their job was to take care of these patients. We took over the fifth floor of the hospital, made it into an ICU, and so we had one trauma slash burn attending and one other kind of attending, mostly vascular and pediatric surgery, who stayed in-house 12-hour shifts. Um, and so we had that crew taking care of these patients. In the first 48 hours, we had 22 of our 39 patients were intubated. They all got bronched. 17 patients had escherotomies, as you can see here, with uh, some rather deep hand burns. They had their bedside debridements. We made our OR plan about 18 hours or so after the event. We had a huge family meeting in an auditorium about three times the size. It was filled with about 300 family members. We met with the press and government officials, and one thing you find out when this happens, the only thing worse than the press is the government, and everybody from the mayor to the governor to the this to the that to the lieutenant governor, our two representatives, our two senators, and everybody in between who had ever run for office in Rhode Island obviously showed up for the PR. There, some of them were helpful. The governor, uh, Governor Kacheri, was an extremely helpful individual, as was our two senators uh, uh, at the time. We had 100 percent survival of our patients. One patient did develop acute renal failure, uh, but that resolved after about a month of dialysis. There were nine trachs, over 100 bronchs, 43 excision and graftings in the first two weeks. Our length of stay was 1.39 days per percent burn, and it ranged from one day to 100 days. The one day were obviously small burns. The 100 day was the individual with the developed acute renal failure, and he had about a 60 percent burn. And if you broke it out by inhalation and no inhalation injury, because that length of stay is long, but if you broke it out by that, you can see with patients without inhalation injury, it stayed about three quarters of a day per percent burn, still slightly long, but given the magnitude of the event, not bad. And for patients with inhalation injury, they stayed considerably longer. There were a lot of peculiar aspects about, this, uh, about these burns. All patients required massive resuscitations, and by that I mean far in excess of what the Parkland formula produced. <coughs> 10 and 12 cc's per kilo per percent burn resuscitations. 
we had a number of, I think six patients that had cyanide toxicity and I'd actually never seen a patient in the 15 or 18 years I'd taken care of burn patients with cyanide toxicity. But we did, and these patients can't extract oxygen so they get extremely acidotic and there are antidotes that you treat them with. And that was probably due to some of the uh, elements that were in the fire. There were a lot of head and hand burns, as you can imagine, which makes for an incredible psychosocial kind of thing because these are the things that we see when we first meet people is our face and our hands. There were triage issues, and importantly, there were severe inhalation injury. And you could see from that video I showed the amount of smoke that was uh, in the environment. Um, and so the inhalation injury, I'd like to di digress for just a couple of moments. Inhalation injury occurs in about a quarter of burn patients. It's not surprising. It results in ventilation and oxygenation abnormalities. But when people get inhalation injury, unlike when they get pneumonia or something, about four-fifths of them do require intubation. And nosocomial pneumonia and ventilator-associated pneumonia are common. Inhalation injury is a lot different than ARDS because it's on the epithelial side. It's a, it's a chemical injury to our airway. And so we lose the lining of our airway. We get a lot of sloughing uh, and secretions that occur. And why do we really care about inhalation injury? This is data from when I worked in San Antonio that looked at the incidence of pneumonia in people with inhalation injury. And so this has taken all patients during that five-year period admitted to the burn center. If they didn't have inhalation injury, the incidence of pneumonia was pretty low, only 8%. For patients that had a positive bronchoscopy on the far right, the incidence of pneumonia was just over 45%. Why do we care about that? Because of the adequate impact it has on mortality. And this is the mortality, predicted mortality for a 50-year-old, which is how old I am, with about a 20 to 40 percent burn during that period. If they didn't have inhalation injury, the predicted mortality was 2 percent. That is, almost everybody should survive unless they had significant other comorbidities. If they had an inhalation injury in combination, the predicted mortality was 38 percent. But if they are one of those one in two patients that develop pneumonia, the predicted mortality went up to near 70 percent. So this is an important aspect in the care of burn patients. And it far exceeds the impact that pneumonia has in routine ICU patients where we argue about does ventilator-associated pneumonia ever kill anybody. We often say people die with it, but they don't die because of it. For burn patients, that's not a true comment. Well, how do we treat it? It's supportive. We have no magic bullets. It's a heterogeneous injury, as you can imagine. And so the idea is to minimize ventilator-induced lung damage. And we had had a long-term interest in that from the time that I started training in the early 80s at Vermont where I had the opportunity to meet Forrest Bird. Forrest Bird was the man who created ba Bird baby ventilators back in the 60s. And he had been working on some other ventilators, some high frequency ventilators, and I got to meet him as an intern and now I've had a near 30 year relationship with him, helping him and working on his various ideas of ventilators. So we had had some ideas of what we wanted to do with inhalation injury, but this was our treatment protocol. Lung protective ventilation strategies, which I'll show you in a moment, frequent bronchoscopy, aerosolized heparin, early tracheostomy, and for patients with severe oxygenation abnormalities, prone positioning. In the eight years I spent in San Antonio, we tried a host of other things. Much of my research early on was in this area, inhaled nitric oxide, liquid ventilation, ECMO, various other uh, supports, NOS inhibitors, and pharmacologic therapies. And as we talked about yesterday in the research presentations, the only thing we ever saw that worked turned out to be pentoxifiline, but it only worked in our sheep animal model, and when we tried to do it in pigs and primates, it didn't work. So there really are no magic bullets. This is a slide that you don't really need to see, but it's to understand that over the last 30 years, we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to treat patients with ARDS and various things. And all of these studies on this slide are negative except for the one at the bottom, which is the ARDSnet trial. And this is data from that, which was the first time that we knew that we could do something for pe people with ARDS and impact their outcome. And this was lung protective therapy with low volume. And you can see there's a uh, significant decrease in mortality in patients that were treated with six to eight ml per kilo uh, strategies. And so this is a strategy we had adopted in the mid 80s, and this is an article now in the year 2000. I put this slide in just to remind us of one thing. That ARDSnet trial is the only study that's out there that shows a significant reduction in mortality, a relative reduction in mortality of almost 30 percent, an absolute of about 8 to 10 percent. And this is a study done in New England and Boston a couple of years after it was published. And what they did is they took historical controls and looked at tidal volumes pre net, and that's that first uh, thing. And you can see they range from about 9 to 15 mLs per kilo. And then they went to three teaching hospitals in New England. They happened to be in Boston, not at Providence. And they looked at what happened after this was published. So these are intensivist-led uh, ICUs. And what they found is 
that trial had almost no impact on our care of our patients, which I only always find a curious thing about how we change our practice patterns and how we look at data and we read articles and say, wow, it makes sense, and then we go home and we do the same thing we've always done. Well, to go back to what we did, my uh, time with Forrest Bird, he was talking about high-frequency ventilation. This is a waveform of the high-frequency ventilator that we started using in the early 80s, and then we started using in burn patients in the late 80s. And the concept is shown here, and that is, if ventilation injury is a heterogeneous disease with airway obstruction, we don't want to overventilate the uh, good lung and injure it, and we want to try to have equal uh, distribution of our ventilation and oxygenation. And so we had spent a lot of time working in small and large animal models, and I'll show just two data slides. This is a primate study we did in the late 80s and early 90s in which we tried high-frequency ventilation, oscillatory ventilation, and conventional uh, pressure-controlled ventilation. In a primate model of severe smoke injury, they were injured, they were put in an ICU for a week. And the bottom line is, is that this form of ventilation, this lung protective strategy, not only decreased pro-inflammatory pro-inflammatory cytokines release in the BAL. There was marked histologic improvement in survival just by changing the ventilatory strategy that we used in these animals. We looked at it in our patients, and this is an article that Loring Rue and I published in the Archives of Surgery in 93, and the important data is shown here, and that is by using this lung protective strategy, we were able to reduce the incidence of pneumonia, and then based on the data I showed you before, it's not surprising that we improve survival. There are lots of other ways of doing this, this is from Rob Sheridan at the Boston Shrine, just showing that you can achieve similar results in kids by using pressure-controlled ventilation. Well, let's go back to mass burn disasters for a moment and how we did. If we look across the world over the last uh, 100 years or so, these are the major mass burn disasters. And the sort of largest one was in 1871 in Wisconsin, where an entire town burned, and there were over 2,000 deaths. In Mexico in 1984, 300 people, 700 injured out of 60,000 people evacuated. In 1989, there was a, a, two trains collided in a tunnel in Siberia, one filled with kids coming back from a holiday. There were 800 treated and 150 burns, and we actually spent two, sent two burn teams there that spent two months taking care of those kids in Siberia. And the MGM Grand Fire, which many of you remember in 1982, had 300 smoke victims but no burn victims. If we look at world indoor burn disasters since 1970, the Station Fire in Rhode Island ranks as the fourth deadliest indoor fire disaster. It had the second largest number of treated burns, and the average burn size was greater than any recent disaster, despite the fact that it was only just under 20 percent. And this chart shows those. There was the Beverly Hills uh, Kentucky Nightclub Fire, 165 deaths, but only 70 treated patients. Buenos Aires, just a couple of years ago, you remember that, there were 150 deaths and 700 treated patients, but there's a station fire, 96 immediate deaths, four late deaths, and then another almost 200 treated individuals. If we look from across the United States, the Iroquois Theater fire in Chicago in 1903 ended up with 600 deaths almost. Coconut Grove, which we're going to talk about in a minute, in 1942, 500 deaths. And so the station fire is right up there. And if we go back to 9-11 and think about the number of patients, there were only 138 hospitalized patients from New York City from the World Trade Center disaster, as it, you know, most people were killed in that. But just to put it in relative magnitude, that this fire disaster actually ended up with more hospitalized and cared for patients. I'd like to compare and contrast Coconut Grove and the station fire for a moment, because they have some pretty eerie similarities. Coconut Grove fire, uh, at Coconut Grove, it was built for 600 patrons. There were 1,000 patrons in the building. The station nightclub, which had actually been a gas station originally, it got revamped into a, uh, into a restaurant and eventually revamped into this, station, into this nightclub, it was built for 200 and had 439 people in it. They both occurred just after 10 o'clock at night. They both occurred because of flammable material. In Coconut Grove, the way the fire was started was, if, if you know, it was a BC Holy Cross football game, and depending who you're rooting for, the wrong team uh, won. Um, but there was a couple that was in a corner in a booth, and they had snuffed out the candle, and the uh, guy that was running the place told one of his busboys to go back over and light the candle and to tell them that they could take their ar armorous activity somewhere else. So he did. He went over, he lit the candle, or he lit the candle on the wall. Unfortunately, there was a bunch of crepe paper on the wall, and he lit the crepe paper at the same time, and that's how the fire started. So it's clearly a preventable event. In the station nightclub, the owners had gotten a few months before complaints from the uh, surrounding community that it was too noisy. So they said, well, we've got to soundproof our area. So they went out to buy soundproofing stuff. 
and they had the choice of $600 non-flame resistant soundproofing or $1,000 or $1,200 flame resistant soundproofing. They bought the $600 stuff and put it on the ceilings and walls. And when these prior techniques were set off, they uh, took that foam, started on fire, and that's how the fire started. Curiously, both places had just undergone fire inspections and passed. Coconut Grove had 170 treated patients. We had 186. There was a lot more deaths. Twice the number went to the OR from ours, but they were both preventable fires. This is a quote uh, from uh, what was, uh, or what is now the Boston Globe, that talked about the Coconut Grove fire some 60 years ago, and you can read it for yourself. But basically it says, you know, we know what we're doing. This isn't rocket science. We should be able to prevent these fires. We should learn a lot from Coconut Grove. We should enforce our fire <laughs> regulations, and we could prevent these fires, and clearly we didn't do that. I'd like to just take the last few minutes to look about how we did and how, our, how did our hospital system and state system work. And this is a quote from Apollo 13, and it sort of depends if you're an optimist or a pessimist how you look at these things. And one guy says this is going to be the biggest disaster in the history of NASA. And you remember the other guy looks at him and says, you know, in all due respect, it's going to be our finest hour. So I guess it depends how you look at it. Well, what worked for us? Our internal disaster plan worked, surprisingly enough. It's the first time we had to really use our new revamped plan this hike system, that administrative uh, bureaucratic nonsense, which is what I always thought those charts were, they actually worked. From hospital administration to the chief of medicine to the, chair, the chief of pulmonary critical care to trauma to surgery, et cetera, people knew their jobs. They showed up. They did them. There was no infighting. There was no issues. It was very clear what everybody's job was, and it worked. Clearly, our hospital's commitment to a trauma center worked, and being a level one trauma center and seeking American College of Surgeons designation is important because it shows the commitment you have, just like when you go for NCI designation for your cancer center. It's a sign of commitment that you're willing to put the resources into the care of these patients. The regional resources, including the mass burn centers, worked, and I would say, you know, with only four late deaths, the outcomes, despite having more treated patients, a larger burn size, and more patients with inhalation injury, is the best outcome in any mass burn disaster in recorded history. Federal aid eventually worked. We did get some help from FEMA, but I must admit the federal government didn't help us very much. Well, what didn't work? We learned that our state system was terrible. There was no field triage. We had four helicopters at our disposal, and at one time, all four helicopters were sitting at a 150-bed community hospital doing nothing. The distribution of patients from the field didn't work well, and we really learned that we had no state system and really poor communication between the hospitals in our state, despite the fact that we're the smallest, you know, we're a very small state. When I moved from San Antonio to Rhode Island, Rhode Island has less landmass than the city of San Antonio. And I went there thinking that I could very quickly and easily build a model state trauma system. And here we are more than 15 years later since I got there, and we, or, or about 15 years, and we haven't really achieved that, although we're getting further along now. We found out we really didn't have a regional system as it relates to the AAST, the American Association for Surgery and Trauma, or the American Burn Association. And as I said before, the federal support didn't work. Well, where did we go then over the last four years? Well, on a hospital level, we're still committed to this. We practice different scenarios. We've expanded our drills and we've gone for uh, verification for our burn centers. On a state level, we got, a, we got a, a consultative visit for our state trauma system. We applied for federal grants that we got. We're building our state trauma system now. It actually is a, it's starting to work. Um, online databases, predetermined protocols that we didn't have before that you all have had in this area for some 20 years with your EMS. We didn't have that. Collaboration of competitors. As actually, as you can imagine, all, all hospitals, just like you, I'm amazed, you know, your competitors are surround you. Um, but we've been able to collaborate on several things, and this is one of them. On a regional level, the Committee of Trauma of the college, the American Burn Association, and AAST have all stepped up their regional activities with a renewed sense of importance. But the thing that we learned is that this is important for surgeons to do. It really is. And, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll give you two, one good example of that. One of the scenarios that we practiced was, well, what would you do if you had a bunch of people exposed to a biologic and you could pick one? And the treatment is you just got to give antibiotics to 50,000 people. Well, I said, you know what? That's not in my area. My chair of medicine's an infectious disease guy. They ought to take care of that. And so I didn't bother to participate and go to that. And they did a drill. And it was amazing to me, the cluster, you know what, that occurred. <laughs> 
because of their inability just to do this. We do this all the time. As surgeons, we're used to leading. We lead in the operating room. We lead what we do. It's our mindset. And I'm not, I'm not trying to really denigrate my medical colleagues here, but it's not in their mindset. It's not what they do on a daily basis, and we do. It's important that we lead this way, even if it's not in our specialty. As I said, I had pediatric surgeons, vascular surgeons, surgical oncologists all participating in this, and they still participate in it because we think it's important. There have been some benefits to us. On a hospital level, I get more money for our trauma center. Um, they realize it's important and it's a hallmark part of our institution in the region. The Rhode Island Disaster Initiative we got funding for, now we have the ability to send a team and an ambulance to the sites of disasters where we now have, by Department of Health Authority, the ability to set up and control triage at those things. Our simulation center we've gotten more funding for, that's important for surgical education and we're about to build a new education building at Brown in which we'll build a bigger simulation center, but it's important and we use it in surgical education and we use it for other things. So that was an important spinoff for this. We developed a center of excellence in critical care with our medical colleagues in a collegial collaborative way with the understanding that we're not here to take over each other unit, but we're going to do that. And we certainly had improved relationship with our state and federal legislators. I know our senators and our representatives on a first name basis. I have dinner with them when they're back in the state. I see them in Washington, and that's actually helped a lot with a lot of other issues, including trying to get funding for our cancer center and things like that. So there was a, a, a spinoff, a non-trauma spinoff for the department, for the hospital. I've already talked about the state and what's happened there. From a personal perspective, it's amazing what this really does and what happens when you go through something like this. Uh, up in the upper left-hand corner, uh, Salim Sooner, who's head of the Rhode Island Disaster Initiative, he's an emergency medicine physician. Jane Metzger in the middle, who's our uh, chief uh, vice, senior vice president for inpatient affairs, and on the right is our hospital CEO, who happens to be actually, he just stepped down, but he's a minimally invasive surgeon, the guy who uh, started uh, the ultrasonic shears back in like, 1991 or so, which became the harmonic scalpel myself. I can take credit for one thing, it's Connie Chung on the right. Um, I got interviewed twice by Connie Chung. Uh, they were very curious interviews. They were not live interviews, although I did do live interviews with people from the Today Show and this and that. But for Connie Chung, they were all remote interviews. And the first one was a couple days after, and the second one was about two weeks after the event, and things were starting to wind down. We were doing well. And I get interviewed at about 10 o'clock at night, and at 8 o'clock the next morning, she was fired. So you can thank me for taking Connie Chung off the airways. <laughs> I come all the way from New England. It was, uh, it's, uh, I really have enjoyed my visit here. I enjoyed yesterday. We're very proud of our sports teams. We uh, still have the best record in baseball, I think, although we lost last night. And of course, the Patriots are going to win the Super Bowl again. We all know that. But it's really been a great visit. I appreciate the opportunity to come visit UCSD, and most especially uh, to be the uh, fifth Hansborough lecture. Thanks much.